right. Uh, thanks, Davide. Thanks, everybody, for uh, attending this talk today. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief rundown about you know, 10, 12 minutes or so about some recent work that I've been doing. Uh, and this has been a work that's been co-led with another PhD student in my lab, now graduated, Stanley Zhao. Um, and so we're going to be talking about um, chromatin organization and topological changes that we see in, in prostate cancer. So to get started, we can kind of jump into some of the background here. Um, that, you know, you have probably all heard this story about, you know, DNA stretched out linearly would be more than two meters long, but it's able to be compressed down inside, you know, some microscopic cell. And this structure, you know, you can look inside a cell and see within the nuclei where the chromosomes roughly locate inside the nucleus. But this isn't just like you smush them all together. There is some structure that's present in the DNA within the nucleus. And so if you zoom in on the individual chromosomes and look at these strands of chromatin, the DNA and all of its you know, proteins and things that uh, make up the physical chromatin that you can see under a microscope, it has this structure at these different length scales. So largely you see these chromosome territories in, in these uh, you know, pictures on the right. And if you zoom in a little bit more, you can see these things that are called compartments or these topologically associated domains. These are essentially hubs of chromatin interactions, different regions of the DNA coming together in three-dimensional space and interacting with each other. And these hubs you know, form these sort of large structures within the nucleus. If you zoom in even further, you can look at these more localized interactions between say cis-regulatory elements like enhancers, promoters, and other parts of the gene. Um, and so you have these, again, linearly distant regions of the genome coming together in 3D space. And this is you know, one mechanism through which genes and their expression can be regulated. If you zoom in even further, you can look at these beads on a string model that you can see under a microscope where the DNA wraps around these nucleosomes. And so if you look at all these different structures of the DNA inside the cell, you can see that at the, these different length scales, these different structures emerge. And these patterns aren't just random, they have some you know, biological properties associated with them. For this talk, I'm really going to be focusing on this sort of middle branch here, the loops, the clusters, the topologically associated domains. Um, so these domains, you know, they have function and they um, control how genes get expressed and, and regulated inside different cell types and disruption to the structure can lead to uh, different disease. Uh, so a really clear example is from a, a 2015 paper in Cell where um, this research group looked at these different hand malformations that occurred in development. And what they found is that in certain topologically associated domains, the interaction between a cluster of enhancers and a target gene could be disrupted by structural variants that occurred at either end of this domain. And by disrupting these boundaries and having this enhancer cluster interact with other genes, it could lead to these different phenotypes that were very clear in development. Another more recent example was this um, so rare developmental disease that was found both in humans and mice um, related to this EN1 and mainly um, gene uh, pair of genes and their cis regulatory elements and how structural variants that occur within this topologically associated domain can lead to some of these uh, quite severe uh, limb malformations that you can see um, in, in this figure here. So both of these papers are you know, really interesting and show the role of mutations, genetic aberrations, and how they affect um, gene expression and phenotypes and how they're mediated through these structural changes to the chromatin. Um, and so, you know, this is still a developing field, figuring out how these genetic aberrations lead to these different phenotypes and what causes them is still not really well understood. And so our lab, we focus on um, various types of cancers. So one place that we wanted to look at is see, you know, how do structural variants um, and other mutations or affect the chromatin organization? And how does this play a role in cancer, if any? Um, and so the disease that we decided to look at was uh, prostate cancer. So structural variants are extremely common in prostate cancer. This has been known and well studied. Uh, and this kind of is exemplified by this tempers to erg fusion that happens in uh, about 50% of uh, primary prostate tumors. Um, this is a, a data from the CPC gene cohort, a uh, collection of primary prostate tumor samples uh, collected and, and run um, here at uh, UHN in Princess Margaret. Uh, 
And so you can see the recurrence of these structural variants across these patients. And these structural variants are associated with a number of you know, other co-occurring deletions, such as P10, um, epigenetic changes, such as DNA methylation, histone acetylation, and notch signaling. And so these structural variants play some role in the etiology of these diseases, but exactly how this occurs is not entirely clear. Um, but we do know that structural variants are both common in prostate cancer and can lead to um, you know, more aggressive disease. Some recent papers in 2018 and 2019 found that looking at um, the amplification of cis-regulatory elements upstream of this one particular gene, the androgen receptor, that's a really important gene in prostate cancer, um, is associated with um, metastasis and decreased survival. And uh, more recently, um, the duplication of uh, this Fox mind enhancer that's near FOXA1, another really important gene in prostate cancer, uh, was more heavily found um, in metastatic disease. So the presence of certain types of structural variants are associated with this more aggressive disease phenotype in prostate cancer. So what we wanted to do is to you know, dig into this association between how structural variants can affect um, the chromatin organization of cells in prostate cancer and how this may be associated with a different type of disease. Uh, and so to do this, we make use of a technique called high c this is a, a certain type of DNA sequencing whereby you know, linking these different regions, the genome together, and by sequencing them in this particular way, we can essentially look at how often pairs of different regions of the genome come together. And so we have this sort of you know, schematic of the linear genome and what shape it might take in three dimensions by doing some fancy math and counting the pairs and how frequently these different pairs of regions are found in the same sequencing read, we can calculate this thing called the contact matrix that gives us this information about you know, how frequently different regions of the genome interact with each other. And we can use this to then identify TADs, compartments, and other um, you know, important regulatory interactions inside these cells. And so um, this is typically done on many, many cells, say millions of cells, but primary tumor samples are really, really small. And so my co-lead for, for this work, Stanley, spent a lot of time um, basically troubleshooting and optimizing this protocol to work on really small numbers of cells. And what we're able to do is actually get a really good high quality um, high C library from a, a collection of 12 primary tumor samples and five benign samples. And so then using this, we can look at some of the differences that occur between benign prostate tissue and tumor tissue and how that relates to this, you know, other story of, of mutations affecting these things leading to differential expression. So let's jump into some of those results here. If we focus on the TADs, these hubs of chromatin interactions, and look at, um, you know, how they look in both benign and tumor tissue, what we find is that, you know, sort of regardless of how closely we zoom in on these different TAD structures, the number of TADs that we see in both the benign and tumor samples is relatively similar. And the same goes for the actual strength of these boundaries here, where by looking at these two different phenotypes, we actually see a very similar global organization of the chromatin. So that there doesn't appear to be that much uh, difference between them, uh, despite their very different phenotypes. Uh, same goes when we actually zoom in a little bit more and say zoom uh, go away from the TAD structure and more into the chromatin mm -hmm. loops themselves. We can identify loops that are tumor specific or benign specific or shared between them, but largely when you look at these contact matrices and how frequently these different regions of the genome interact with each other, they're all very similar to each other. The tumor specific loops in tumor samples look very similar to the so-called tumor specific loops in benign samples. The differences in their uh, contact are very subtle. So again, overall, what we find is our you know, first major finding of this work is that the genome topology is pretty stable across oncogenesis. There aren't really that many differences, both on sort of the larger global scale or at the more focal scale relating cis-regulatory interactions to each other. These are pretty well consistent between benign and tumor tissue. So what we wanted to do is look at you know, what role do structural variants play in um, the structure between these two diseases, uh, sorry, between these two um, phenotypes. And what you can see here is 
we're actually able to use HiC data to identify the location of structural variants within these samples themselves. We don't necessarily need whole genome sequencing. We can actually just get this information from HiC data itself. And so if you look at this contact matrix here, we have a bunch of these um, patients, and we're looking at a specific region on chromosome one, or sorry, chromosome 21. And you can see these sort of blips way up high in the samples in the bottom row. And this is indicative of a structural variant, a deletion occurring at this particular site. We already know that this exists, and this is that um, you know, tempers to er fusion that I mentioned earlier. And so we know that these exist in these patients. So what we're able to do is use our HiC data to identify structural variants across the genome. Um, what we are able to find is that while we are able to call more structural variant breakpoints with whole genome sequencing, we actually find a lot more of these inter-chromosomal events with our HiC data. And you can look at this, for example, um, on the uh, in one particular patient, we can actually identify these sort of complex variants that bring together these really distant regions of the genome together. You can look at uh, sort of these you know, little blips in this contact matrix here, and these are the in indicators of a structural variant. And HiC gives us this way of really easily visualizing the complexity of these variants and where they come up um, in these different patients. And so to finally sort of get at you know, how these structural variants are affecting um, TAD structures and uh, the chromatin organization overall, we wanted to look at whether the presence of a structural variant breakpoint was associated with changes to the TAD structure around that breakpoint. And for the most part, we don't actually see that. The locations where the structural variants take place is not directly tied to the you know, breaking apart or merging of these different TADs. So the case that I mentioned in the introduction, where there's this sort of clean structural variant, clear phenotype, that's rarely the case here. And we can look at how this relates to gene expression and find that you know, the TADs that have differentially expressed genes don't really occur in the same places where these TADs are altered. And so there's this disconnect between structural variants and gene expression changes and topological chromatin organization changes. So there's this decoupling between them that isn't entirely clear, um, but overall these TADs that um, we can find with our HiC data are largely immutable to structural variants. They don't really change that much in the presence of these genetic aberrations. So how do these structural variants work? Well, largely if we look at the cases where differential gene expression is found, most of these structural variants have genes that are both overexpressed and underexpressed. Rarely you only have, say, an increase in the expression and a decrease in the expression. Most often you have both of these things occurring simultaneously. And so, you know, how does this happen? Well, we know in uh, one particular case is sort of this uh, cis-regulatory element hijacking, where a cis-regulatory element of one gene actually gets hijacked through this um, structural variant and is used by another gene. And a really good case example of this is the tempers 2 erg fusion, where this active promoter of the tempers 2 gene gets fused to the end of uh, the ERG gene, and this leads to the overexpression of ERG. Another really good case example that I'll finish up here with um, is the BRAF gene, where the three prime end of BRAF gets translocated over to chromosome 19, and this three prime end makes contact with the new cis-regulatory elements on chromosome 19, leading to its overexpression. And so finally, the last point that I want to make is that our structural variants repeatedly hijack cis-regulatory elements and alter gene expression at both ends of the gene or of the variant. And so to conclude the work that I'm talking about here, we've been able to optimize a low-input HiC method for tissue slides so that we can work with primary tissue samples. The chromatin organization is stable over oncogenesis and resistant to structural variants. And finally, we've developed a framework to investigate the effect of alterations to the genetic architecture in primary tumors uh, in both um, normal and disease settings. Uh, so that's it. I have lots of people to thank here, um, but I realize I'm a little bit short on time. So I'll just say we uh, produced a preprint of this. Uh, we really appreciate any feedback on that, but for now, I'll take any questions.